Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to episode number two of the Conception to Completion series, where today we're going to focus on uh, using mobile LiDAR data to create point clouds and, and final deliverables. On the call here today, we've got myself, Dylan Jones, I'm out of our Maple Grove, Minnesota office. And we have Nathan Stevenson doing a bulk of the uh, of the presentation, him and I. Um, he's out of our Arvada office. And we also have a few other teammates here on the call, Bob Green and Steve Richter, and um, they'll help out where necessary. In today's session, we're going to focus on a few things all related to mobile LIDAR. So first, um, if you weren't um, around at our first webinar, we're going to quickly review what mobile mapping or mobile LIDAR is, what the data capture process looks like, how we take that captured data and make it accurate data, and then what we do with it from there as far as data extraction and deliverables go. And feel free to uh, chime in on the on the chat if you have any questions. Um, otherwise, uh, we will answer questions at the end as well. And so to kick it off here, um, I'm going to discuss what mobile mapping is. For those of you who aren't familiar, it's typically a vehicle mounted data capture system like you see there on top of the, um, the roof of the vehicle mounted to crossbars. What that's capturing is typically LIDAR data or a point cloud and typically imagery to go along with that. So something like a street view, a 360 degree, degree camera is typically involved there. And so that's mobile mapping. On our project that we are demonstrating here throughout our web, our web series, we use the Trimble MX9 uh, mobile mapping system. So there's a good close up picture of it there on the left. It, it contains two uh, laser sensors, 360 camera, and then three additional cameras, um, two off to the side and one off the back, taking pictures of the road pavement. Mounted on top of a SUV, but really any vehicle that supports uh, the weight of the system uh, on crossbars on top of the vehicle should work for the most part. And then we also used a base station, a local base station, uh, of some type logging one hertz um, base data. And we use that later on for post-processing or PPK. So a couple things that I did want to point out here is on our project, uh, we had a multiple lane, uh, pretty busy road. We drove the vehicle around 30 miles per hour, usually between 20 and 40 miles an hour is what we're typically capturing data at, but we can certainly go well be beyond that speed. And for this, uh, for this project, we did two passes, one going north, one going south. And the total time, including the setup and teardown of the system on the vehicle um, data capture, that took about one hour. Just a quick Google Earth fly in here of where our uh, project area is at. It's a one mile roadway stretch um, near our office there uh, in the Denver area. And so, we wanted to capture mainly the roadway data with the mobile LIDAR system. And then later on in our webinar, webinar series, we're going to be talking about aerial LIDAR and terrestrial LIDAR involved in the same use case or the same project area. So there's some areas that are um, going to be great for mobile LIDAR. There's going to be some areas where the aerial LIDAR definitely shines. You can see here just kind of a zoomed in view of this creek crossing that goes underneath the roadway. We wanna capture all of that with aerial LIDAR. And then we also have a uh, tunnel going underneath um, the roadway as well, where we're going to use terrestrial LIDAR um, to capture that information and really give us a full, um, complete picture of the area. So let's take a look at what the mobile mapping data capture looks like on the system. Um, it's a browser-based software. Um, so basically any, any device that supports a, a web browser and Wi-Fi, we can connect up to the system and capture that information from that device. And so there's different things that we can display on the map. We could get our street map showing us all the road labels and such. We also get a recording overlay. So you can see following or trailing 
that arrow on the map, that's where we've driven. You'll see a boulder line where you've recorded information. Then you can also load in a KML file. Um, so if you have a large project area, you wanna make sure that you capture everything in that area. You could load in a KML file or a Google Earth file uh, to make sure that you've um, driven through all of the, uh, the lines, essentially. And then you also have a live camera and laser view. Um, so that uh, animation there would have shown uh, the different camera um, sensors and laser data live while we're capturing information. So once we capture that information, we then need to make it accurate. And so the ways that we do that is first um, post-processing the information against the reference base station through a software called POSPAC. And so this is essentially a PPK processing software where ultimately we want a improved trajectory of the system. We then take the, the file from that software and um, feed it into uh, Trimble Business Center. And this is where we do a bulk of the data processing and extraction. So primarily to get the data accurate, we're going to post-process with POSPAC and then use Trimble Business Center to do ground control registration. Not every project requires ground control registration, to be, but to get uh, the best accuracy possible from your mobile LiDAR system, you definitely want to use ground control. And then after the ground control registration, we then do things like colorization of the point cloud, feature extraction, viewing photos, CAD drafting, surface creation measurements, and then if necessary, export to a third party software. So talking about ground control targets, right? We have ground control targets to improve the accuracy, and we're essentially tying the uh, collected LIDAR data um, and, and essentially pinning that to our ground control targets that are surveyed in with traditional um, uh, survey equipment. So here's an example of a chevron that's painted on the side of a, of a roadway, and we're logging a static position over the top of those chevrons to get a position of that control data. Now, static GNSS might be one of the ways that you uh, collect that control information. You might use RTK, you might use a total station, you might use a digital level, for instance. Um, the more information and redundancy you have there, uh, the more certainty that you have uh, in, in good control, right? So mobile LiDAR data, when you compare it um, as control worthy versus, or when you compare it against control, it's really as accurate as what your control accuracy is. And so running things like a least squares adjustment um, is, is only going to make things better. And um, it really just depends on what is acceptable for your project specifically. So when it comes to the registration side of things, what we're doing here is we're importing a set of control points into our into the software, and we are tying that to the LiDAR data, okay, or the LiDAR data to the ground control points, I should say. And through a series of uh, computations, the software is then going to make adjustments to our trajectory and then potentially uh, give us a, a much better result. As you can see there in the bottom right hand corner, it might be significant. It might not be really that much movement, but we have a before and an after of the point cloud data. And uh, you can see that the LiDAR data goes straight through the ground control point. Um, it's showing a, a much better result vertically at least. And what that looks like here in, in the Trimble Business Center software is we're picking out those targets. In this instance, we used circles painted on the side of the roadway. Uh, but essentially, we just need some sort of reference for our ground control um, control points. And on the left, we're essentially finding the center of that circle, or it might be a corner of a chevron. So horizontally, we're defining the coordinates of that, uh, of that control point on the target on the left. And then on the right, we're defining the Z value or the, or the vertical component. Once we've done that for enough uh, targets um, along our roadway, we then have residuals. And so this is just a screenshot of what that registration window looks like. Gone through and done several ground control targets. 
and we can see in this section of the window easting, northing, and elevation residuals. And that's something that can be put uh, into a report later on. So once you have accurate data, it's now time to produce deliverables, or in, uh, a lot of times we say the, the word extract. So we want to extract points. Sometimes that might be assets, it might be um, just other uh, you know, ground shots, whatever that might be. We're extracting points, we're extracting line work. And then from typically those um, features, we would then create a mesh or a surface model. From those meshes or surface models, we can perform volumetric calculations. We can perform point to point measurements uh, where we want uh, you know, a slope measurement uh, in a percentage. A lot of times that could be used um, uh, to analyze ped ramps or sidewalk cross slope, things like that, uh, measure areas. And then if we go through, we, we scan an area, we scan it later on, we could do a change detection type report um, where we see how things have changed over time. We use the point cloud data to do that. We could also do clash detection for things like tunnels or railways, and then also flatness, verticality inspections on walls or ground or whatever that the feature might be that we want to scan. Um, road surface conditions, 3D models. We talked a lot about uh, the digital twin in our previous webinar. Um, so building 3D models of cityscapes. Um, and then we also have that imagery uh, to use as documentation over time as well. So on our project, we scanned this mile long roadway and um, we're going to use typically a 3D view to perform extraction. So the point cloud is going to look typically something like this. Okay, It's just millions of points scattered uh, along our roadway tied to ground control. We have the ability to colorize our point cloud based on the imagery. That's what you see here. We have grayscale intensity. So basically that brings out the intensity of uh, or reflectivity of certain surfaces. Uh, you can see reflective objects such as signs, uh, roadway paint stripes and things like that really um, are easy to see in these types of views. You also have color coded intensity and then elevation based gradient um, rendering as well, which I use this for, for uh, specific things on the roadway surface a lot. I'll, I'll give you an example of that here coming up. So along with the 3D view that you see here on the left, we could split off on the right here, the panoramic or other camera views as well. So uh, using that panoramic view to see what uh, the landscape looks like from the eye of the camera, and also pairing that up side by side to the 3D view. And we have these markers here placed along the roadway, which indicate where the camera images were taken from. What's really nice is you can click on these little, these dots and it opens up the camera here on the right to that location. So if we ever needed to verify something like these power lines that were extracted or this pole position, we can do that really quickly. Um, so I use that a lot in my data extraction and processing. Here you're seeing um, somewhat of a new feature actually where you can sync up the, the point cloud on the left with the imagery on the right. So whatever you're looking at for imagery on the right there, it mimics what, what you're looking at as far as a point cloud goes on the left. You can see my line works overlaid there on both sides. And then we have regions of interest. Regions of interest um, might involve just a slice through the roadway like you're seeing here. It's essentially a limit box where I can define a length, width, and height. And now I can uh, follow my alignment of the road using um, the up and down arrow keys to bounce forward or backwards and just really limit the amount of data that's shown so I can quickly uh, just uh, bounce down that roadway and, and verify that I have all of the features that I need extracted really quickly. So using those visualization tools, um, and having the idea of those in the back of my head, I'll now begin the data extraction side of things. Okay, so I again the goal of, of of the mobile lidar side of things on this project is to extract things that are close to the roadway and the roadway features themselves. 
pretty much from edge of sidewalk to edge of sidewalk. And then uh, any other things that are um, maybe overhead in the roadway as well. But we wanna start a lot of times with our point features followed by our linear features. Once we have those features extracted, we can then produce surface models and contours and cross sections and measurements. Okay, so that's the idea. That's my process a lot of times when I uh, go through a mobile LIDAR data set. A lot of times I'll start off also by considering, do I have a set of layers, blocks and symbols that I want to import into my project so that when I, when I extract these features, they have the appropriate layer and color and line type and things like that, right? So a lot of times that's embedded in a feature code library. So not only do you get your code library, but you also get um, the, the essentially the template of your layers and your blocks and symbols to go along with that. So that was essentially my first step in all of this. And now I get into the point extraction. So um, as far as assets go, um, basically taking an inventory of, of things like trees. And so here we have a, a, an example of extracting tree features along the roadway. Um, from that, we use the point cloud data to uh, quickly extract the location of not only um, where that tree is, on the ground, but also the center of that tree. We do that for poles as well. So again, the ground elevation and center of that feature. You can also um, see over here in the bottom right-hand corner, we have more than just the horizontal and, and elevation of that pole. We also have the diameter of the pole, the height of the pole, and inclination values of that pole. So if the pole has any sort of lean, it'll tell us by how much, what degree it's it's leaning and the direction that it's leaning. Sometimes you wanna know that. And same thing for signs. So at this moment we can go through and we can collect that attribute information for trees, poles and signs. And so here's a, an animation showing just some manual extraction of trees. Uh, this would look identical for poles and signs, but I'm essentially going through the three point cloud here. I'm finding a spot on the trunk of the tree. I'm hitting the enter button. It's going to analyze that tree, tell me the height, the spread, and the diameter of that tree trunk. And that's all saved uh, to that point feature. And that can also be exported later on to GIS or CAD. Here's an animation showing things that might not be trees, poles, or signs, right? Um, I'm using measure codes actually in this example. Measure codes is a, is a great way to quickly extract features that, you, you know, when you're constantly having to change the feature code. So you might have different utilities that you need to mark out. You might have um, just things where you're, you're constantly having to change that code rather than typing in a different code for each point, you can use your measure codes dialog here to pick the code of, of choice. This is pretty much identical to anyone that's used Trimble Access before, uh, pretty much identical to that. So that's coming from your feature code library. And there's going to be times where um, the point cloud might not be detailed enough, or you might have obstructions in the point cloud to, um, to extract certain features. So this here, um, this catch basin, was very hard to see in the point cloud. When I went through my data set with my panoramic view camera, I basically drove down the road, looking at this off to the side, and I found this, um, this catch basin here. And that is definitely something that I wanted to survey in here. Um, but it was just hard to see from the point cloud. So what I did is I uh, overlaid the point cloud on top of my imagery and I extracted that, uh, that catch basin feature um, uh, just traditionally uh, using the create point tool. Okay, so extracting from camera views is also a popular way to extract data. Um, that could be for points, lines, or really anything, anything else. Um, so you can really see any you know, features that might be obstructed or just you don't have enough detail in the point cloud data alone. So here's that same feature 
I extracted it. You can see the symbol there over top of it. On the left, this is my plan view, my top down, showing just the point cloud data. So it might have been uh, a feature that was hard for me to see just from bird's eye view of the, of the point cloud, but I was able to extract that from the camera. Um, and this cone, this cone is essentially uh, just showing where I'm looking here in my camera view. Another thing, a lot of times that, that makes things difficult to uh, extract is, is just the color of the point cloud, right? So here we have a point cloud. Uh, I, I extracted this manhole here, but it is very difficult to see that from the true color view. If, if I just quickly switched over to, uh, this is called the color coded by elevation. Um, it's essentially showing me the gradient to the road and I can see pretty much contours and I can see that circular outline of that manhole. That makes it super, super easy to, to be able to extract uh, those types of features in the roadway that might go unnoticed from just a traditional uh, uh, true color or uh, intensity based view. So just a tip or trick there for you guys if you're doing any sort of uh, extraction from point clouds. And then we get into the surface side of things and line work. Okay, so starting with, with some line work extraction. Um, there have been some major, major improvements for linear uh, feature extraction here in the past couple of years um, for extracting things like curb, gutter, barriers, overhead lines, lane line paint markings, fences, guardrails. So you see the list there, uh, right? So um, here we've been able to increase our productivity um, tremendously. And as an example here, um, I tested this out along a, a section of roadway where I performed manual extraction methods in TBC where I was just clicking point to point to point on the curb face and flow line. I did that at 30 foot um, station interval, okay, with detail at driveways and that took about three hours, okay, at a 30 foot interval. Using automated methods, um, so a tool that allows you to automate things, I was able to collect not only the face of the curb and flow line, but also the back of curb. And uh, some people call it the apron or the lip of the curb at a five foot interval cross section with details on the driveways in less than an hour. So a tremendous saving in time um, by using automated approaches. Um, and so software nowadays and also the hardware has made it possible to be able to extract things much more productively from uh, the point cloud data. So here's uh, an animation showing how you do that, uh, that, that extraction of, in this example, we have a curb, right? So we define the nodes on that curb, which are different brake lines, and we essentially hit an extract button or a go button, and it's going to follow that curb feature until it either stops, changes shape, um, you know, one something where it's just going to get hung up, right? So usually it's where it stops or hits a, a driveway or an intersection. And so you can see that it extracted that pretty fast uh, down down the roadway and essentially we're creating those lines then after and we have our curb uh, definition from that. And um, one thing for mobile LiDAR data is that you still get quite a bit of detail even off the roadway in these intersections, you can see how far back that goes, typically within 75 feet to, a, to 100 feet from uh, the road center line. It's, it's, it's typically what I've seen as far as detail goes uh, to be able to extract line work from. So I wanted to show an area where it's a little bit more complex, um, yet still enough detail to be able to extract uh, the information that we need. Um, one thing that we could have done is just drove, driven down this road to be able to fill in these uh, these areas with more detail. Um, but in our in our case here, uh, we just did a pass down the roadway on that side of the road, and um, we I guess had enough information from that pass to uh, complete that uh, that area. Like I said before, you could use um, these extraction um, techniques, these automated extraction techniques for more than just uh, what they're intended to be used for. So in this instance, I was using the curb and gutter extraction tool 
uh, for this uh, this road barrier. Um, if you have really anything that has a defined shape and you know corners to it, we can define those nodes on that feature and be able to use uh, you know this curb and gutter uh, linear extraction um, tool to be able to extract that line work. And so this is a good example of doing that. And, and this is what you typically end up with these 3D um, line strings uh, as a result. Here I wanted to include where I did some manual linear extraction. So more of a point to point, you know, clicking uh, along my linear feature. So this is the guardrail. I'm just drawing that in quickly um, on the top of that guardrail. And down at the bottom, I'm using the CAD command line. Another one of those things that can then that can speed up your extraction process uh, in TBC. So there's my 3D uh, line string of that guardrail. I'll just type in the letter L command for line string, move over to the, uh, the other side and extract the other guardrail here. So this is this is what traditional or manual uh, extraction would look like going point to point to point. You definitely save a lot of time having automated tools where the computer does a lot of that work for you. So we'll move on. Next one here is lane line uh, extraction. So I wanted to extract all of the pavement striping uh, on this roadway. There are several miles of paint lines. And so this is, again, an automated approach to extracting those features. It's essentially using the intensity contrast uh, between the paint and the road surface and the computer is able to detect the center of those paint stripes. It's able to do solid lines, it's able to do dashed lines as you can see there in that animation. So I'll do that one more time. You're essentially clicking on two adjacent uh, lines there, or sorry, dashes, hitting the extract button and it's going to go through and trace out where the rest of those dashes follow. To give you an idea, I think there were six or seven miles of, of paint stripes. I did that in an hour and a half. So uh, again, this is a fairly busy roadway. Having to do that out on foot um, definitely would have been challenging uh, to be able to do that in the same amount of time. Moving on, extracting cross sections from the point cloud. So just from the point cloud alone, what we could do is follow a, a, a an alignment or any other linear feature along the road and be able to cut cross sections at a defined interval. And so you can see here, I, I had my center line alignment uh, as the input. And then I wanted to do a station interval of 25 feet, 75 feet off to the left, 75 feet off to the right, and just extract that ground information at uh, at a point frequency of three feet as you go across the road. And that's just a very simple way, an automated way to be able to extract the ground as, um, as points essentially. And uh, to give you a, a little bit more simplified ground surface of the road versus creating a surface model of the millions of points in the point club. So just an idea there for those of you who haven't used that tool before, I'd urge you to, um, to definitely explore that one a little bit more. Then we have overhead line extraction. So just a quick animation here showing um, we have our power lines, right? Telecom, power lines. And essentially, we're using the point cloud data on those power lines to give it an initial pick on the power lines, tell it that you want to have it extract from point A to point B. And I'll hit play again here. And it's just going to trace those power lines from start to finish. Okay, so from that, we create the traced out line and we have a 3D uh, line string out of that. I'm gonna use those power line line strings later on to show you how we can uh, get clearances of that. So once you've collected all the line work, we collected um, all of our 3D line work, which includes all the things listed there. 
We selected all of those features and we created a surface. So just simply hitting the create surface button, we get a surface. It might be hard to see that, but it kind of fills in in between. And on the next screen, we'll see a little bit more zoomed in view here where we have surface edges um, that might need to be cleaned up. So we see the tin lines, we see the surface edges. I wanna clean up those. Quick and easy way to do that is to adjust the properties of that surface and adjust the maximum edge length here in the properties. Reduce that from 500 to 50 feet. I could even go smaller than that. And just after hitting enter, it's gonna clean up those, uh, those longer edge triangles. From there, I created contours. So I get my contours, I can get the labels on those contours. And then now that I have a surface, I can define cross sections on that surface itself. So this is a little bit different from what I showed before where we were cutting cross sections on the point cloud. This is, this is my, uh, my surface from my, my break lines essentially. And, and um, this is showing a cross section view of that, um, of that road. Uh, model. We get things like labels on certain break lines. Uh, if you've labeled them, I hadn't quite labeled all of them just yet, but um, you can see also we have cross slopes and, um, and we can cut that cross section really anywhere along our surface. One thing you might use your surface for is to do a design versus um, this point cloud generated um, surface model. So I created the point cloud generated surface model. If I want to compare that to a design, um, I would just bring the design file as something like a land XML into uh, Trimble Business Center, got that corridor file loaded in, and then I can um, essentially do analysis of my point cloud generated uh, surface versus the design surface and get things like a cut fill quantity report. Um, I could create a plan set with uh, cross-section sheets. Um, so a lot of powerful tools involved there. Here is uh, an example of a tool that I, I actually don't see very many people using, but could be a great deliverable. Um, we have this tool in the, in the TVC scanning module called the Create Ortho Photo. We have our colorized point cloud shown on the screen right now. We use this ortho photo to generate essentially an image of that point cloud. Um, so we use this create ortho photo tool. We define our rectangle and the pixel size that we want. And then on the next slide, this is actually an ortho image. So I get a question a lot of times, can we take the mobile mapping data and create some sort of ortho image like we would from a drone or something like that? This is one way that you can do that. So this is an ortho image, a TIFF file with uh, correct coordinate um, information. Uh, so it is georeferenced. We could bring that then into GIS or another CAD package and be able to use that for a variety of things. And then one thing that I did is I applied that or an, I, I applied an ortho image to uh, the surface as a surface member. So essentially giving my surface color is what I did there. So you can see that uh, it's just another useful thing uh, in, in regards to utilizing the surface and the ortho image together. Then of course we have just basic measurements. So if you want a horizontal distance, a vertical distance, um, a slope percentage, um, that's just as simple as opening up the ruler and clicking on two points in the point cloud, um, or you could do a, a point in the point cloud to a, any other CAD object really, and, and get your measurements that way. Vertical clearance measurements, tools for, for doing that. I wanna know what the clearances are across the road of, of some power lines or some telecom lines, right? So um, if you're doing any sort of haul, uh, truck hauling analysis, you want to make sure that they're going to clear a bridge or anything like that. Um, we could use the vertical clearance measurement tool. And what that looks like here is I have an animation of that. 
You can do a clearance up or a clearance down. So I'm using the clearance down. I'm gonna click on either a point cloud or a CAD feature. So I already have these um, CAD lines extracted on the, on the power lines. And then I can uh, just get a quick clearance anywhere along that uh, anywhere along that overhead line. And those are savable. So I'm hitting the save button over there on the right after it uh, performed the measurement. And that's saved as, a, as an object in my TVC project. I've seen uh, people create deliverables uh, where they um, want just a simple, you know, kind of like a cross section sheet printout PDF uh, showing sign clearances over over uh, interstate, right? So something uh, that you can use here, this vertical clearance measurement tool. There's also an automated tool that allows you to take an extracted linear feature, hit a simple measure button and it's going to compare, um, or it's actually going to calculate the clearance for each span and give you that um, in just a matter of seconds here. So I have my, my uh, clearance for each span. There might be some instances where there's no ground data available below the, uh, the overhead line, um, but then this could be added. Those, those measurements can be added. They can also be exported out to a CSV file report. So that's what I'm doing here in this animation. Just creating a, a report. This report um, just needs to be cleaned up a little bit uh, where the values are all separated into different cells, but uh, you essentially would then get a clearance report from that. And then again, you can add those as saved measurements here to your project. Okay, next thing, um, which is becoming very, very popular. A lot of people are asking for how can I do a pavement condition assessment um, utilizing mobile LIDAR data, okay? Traditionally, you'd have somebody drive down the road, the passenger would um, either take a video log or just kind of give it a subjective score based on the amount of rutting they see, the amount of cracking and, and other defects that they see in the road and they just kind of jot it down into an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so utilizing mobile LIDAR data for advanced metrics, we can actually locate where rutting is low, where rutting is happening in roadways, where there's um, certain defects, potholes, and export that out to a, a report. Um, so um, very, very um, interesting, and, and there's software out there to, to be able to do that. Photo documentation, of course, uh, we have the camera data. We can um, document things, take screenshots. We can also uh, export out the photos um, and use those as, as a verification tool. So did we extract all of the features along the roadway that we needed to extract or was there anything left behind? Or do we need to know, uh, you know a color of something for attribute data? Um, so those sorts of things using uh, the camera view to do that. Here, this is a 3D drive view, you, uh, actually utilizing a tool that's been in TBC for a long time. So I'm actually overlaying my line work, the point cloud, and I'm turning off different things here when it pauses. So here I eliminated the above ground point cloud data. Um, you can see the power lines there on the right. And then I have the surface model on when I turn off the uh, the point cloud, the surface model appears. Now we're seeing all the extracted information as you know, CAD objects and surface model. I turn the the point cloud above ground back on. Got my ground surface. So really, just um, utilizing this tool that's been all around for a long time. It's, it's called 3D Drive View, um, and this can be used with any sensor data. This doesn't have to be mobile lidar. Um, so just one of those things, a, a unique. Um, type of deliverable or presentation tool that uh, that you can use. And then I've uh, messed around a little bit with creating video logs um, and, and posting those on YouTube. So this is a YouTube video uh, of the 360 degree camera. Okay, just driving down the road, 
have the frame rate set kind of high. That's why it's, it's speeding down the road. But um, here's just you know a simple deliverable that you can give to a client, and uh, and that goes a long way. They can pause, they can rotate around, and and uh, and be able to to see conditions and and document uh, documentation of uh, of a project site. You also have um, ways to publish mobile LiDAR data to uh, the web. Okay, this is, a, this is one that we could export to out of TBC called TMX Publisher. Um, so it's a web-based um, or an online-based viewer. And uh, it's basically your data is hosted on a server. And um, that could be um, a public server or a private server. But regardless, from, from the data, you just log in with uh, with a username and password uh, on a on a website, and then you're viewing all that mobile lidar information here just in a in a web browser. Okay, and, and you could do things like take notes, annotations, um, measurements, and so on. Very powerful. Um, here is uh, an example of using Trimble Clarity, actually exporting out our point cloud and line work and points to Trimble Clarity. So Trimble Clarity, similar in a way to TMX uh, Publisher, but um, maybe a little bit lighter weight at this moment. So we just export that or publish it up to Clarity, um, and then it's gonna be available, uh, depending on the size of, of the project, of course, but it's gonna be available relatively soon. And then in the next slide here, this is me opening up the data set in Trimble Clarity. A little this is a, a gif so it's a little choppy but um, very much like google earth you can open up uh, different tools for measurement note taking annotations you can share this with uh, with really anyone it's web browser based so you just send a link to someone um, you have your street map you also have an aerial um, like satellite view map uh, you can isolate your point cloud uh, you can see here it contains all of my surface contours and 3D line work that I extracted. So this could be a great deliverable for a client to be able to see that mobile LiDAR data and extraction, um, extracted data as well. And then of course, there's the traditional Google Earth export. Very easy. The only thing is that it doesn't support point cloud data. Um, so we can, we can just simply export out our points and lines, text, things like that, open that up in Google Earth, and then just zoom into our data set, turn on and off different layers. As you can see over here on, on the left-hand side, you only wanna see the lines, uh, for example, here. So then zooming into the data set. One really useful thing uh, that Google Earth gives you is uh, a timeline of your imagery, or of their imagery, I should say. Uh, their imagery you can set back to 10 years ago and in this instance right this this development hadn't been built yet but you can see where my extracted line work sits or falls over the top of that uh, historical image so that's uh, the google earth export and then um when you're when you're done using TBC, right? You've extracted all the information. You want to export that out maybe to a different CAD package. Um, you could export everything out to a DWG or a DXF. So this would be all the extracted data: your surface, your line work, your points. Um, so a DWG, DXF, whatever that might be, that format over on the left-hand uh, screenshot. You could also export out your your surface and break lines out to a Land XML file uh, and open that up in a CAD package as well. So here's my uh, extracted data in Civil 3D. I right, see so you're gonna get your surface, you're gonna get your text, line work, points, everything that, uh, that we extracted in, in TBC. If you wanna go to GIS, um, we could write the features to GIS and, and do that relatively in, in live time. Um, there's a GIS module where we where we can connect a GIS provider, um, so something like ArcGIS Pro or whatever you might be using there. Um, connect that geo database into to our TBC project and be able to read and write features between programs. 
Um, so that's very useful for GIS folks uh, to be able to extract data from point clouds and, and write those directly to their GIS database. And we actually did a few years ago um, a webinar on that very thing. So utilizing Trimble Business Center with point cloud data to perform extraction and then integrate the GIS module, ArcGIS, um, to send and receive information through that connection. So check out this webinar if you haven't uh, done so already and you're interested in something like that. And then a lot of times I get asked how long and how accurate is the mobile LiDAR data? How long did it take to extract? How accurate is it? So a couple of years ago, we actually did a case study where we um, where we compared aerial, mobile, and traditional survey methods um, and figured out you know, where the time savings is at when you want to use uh, traditional over mobile LiDAR or mobile LiDAR over aerial or any combination of that, right? So we did a whole study on, on that. Um, so that's something to check out. I'll just tell you that it only took about a day for me to extract all that line work, all those points, and uh, and create that surface model. And so um, again, that was about three quarters of a mile to a mile in length, um, just to give you some sort of reference there. And I've been using TBC for a while, so obviously I'm pretty well versed in in the program. Um, if if anyone's looking for training on on data extraction and utilizing mobile lidar data in TBC. Um, uh, we're there to help for sure. And I wanted to just bring this up again. I, this mobile mapping applications um, table. This is obviously not every single application, but a majority of, of the common ones that we see. I certainly didn't do um, many of the things that you do in, in these other um, divisions or these other applications, but uh, just know that mobile LiDAR does have many applications. And there's plenty more work that could have been done on this data set, um, but it was essentially a preliminary survey or as-built survey that we wanted to um, get many of the roadway features extracted out as possible for our future webinars going forward. Um, and those, actually, I'm going to fast forward here to this to this screen. Those are coming up in the next uh, couple months where we'll be doing some terrestrial scanning uh, use cases. Um, Troy's going to, to moderate that one. And then after that, we're going to do aerial and uh, or drone LIDAR and the final deliverable coming in that one where we really bring it all together, all the mobile LIDAR, terrestrial LIDAR, aerial LIDAR in one final deliverable. And, um, and, and then after that, uh, Robert's going to be talking about more of the construction uh, or vertical build segment of things where scanning fits in uh, with that. So um, I think we're on time here. We have about 10 minutes for questions. If there's any questions, we'll go ahead and take a look at those. Nathan, did anything come through while I was, uh, while I was talking? Hey, Dylan, Nathan here. I don't see any questions right now, but you want to check on your side? Yep, certainly. Well, if there aren't any questions, you certainly yes, know where one. to reach us. Yeah. I see one, Dylan. Uh, speed of data collection and extraction is good. What is the level of accuracy, really? That's the question. Really? Okay, sure. Um, yeah, valid question. Um, it all comes down to that control side of things that I was talking about. How you collect your control. Are you doing a, a redundant observations on your control targets? Are you performing a traverse adjustment or a least squares adjustment on, on your control? And then really utilizing the, um, the registration tool to adjust your your system's trajectory to that. And so what happens actually during that registration process is we are computing a global uh, adjustment across all of the control points for uh, essentially an XYZ shift in the overall trajectory of our system. 
And then it also is going to run through and do a localized adjustment at each control point target. target. So you'll actually see zero, uh, zero residual at your control point targets. It's actually adjusted the, um, uh, the trajectory. And as I, I guess you could somewhat compare it to a, a site calibration in a way. Um, but it's adjusted the trajectory to zero residual at those targets. Now, in between the targets, there's going to certainly be some sort of error, um, right? It can't go through the entire trajectory and eliminate all error. But one thing that you can do to give yourself confidence in a mobile LiDAR application is um, mark validation points in the field. Okay, and use those as vertical validation um, points. And, um, and that's where you're truly going to be able to see what the accuracy of your point cloud is um, in between your controlled targets, okay? So a lot of times we're, what we spec out is um, vertically under five hundredths of a foot across our mobile LiDAR project. As long as we're using good control techniques and we are using enough control points across our project area. So long-winded answer there, but I hope hope that uh, answers it. I think one point too, Dylan, is you had mentioned there is a, um, a case study recording that Jay did a couple of years ago. Um, and I want to say that he did some of that validation and reports the results in that um, case study, uh, if you want yes. to check that out. Definitely check out this. This is on YouTube, case study uh, from April 2020. And that is going to explain how we did everything, as well as show you results uh, in regards to accuracies. And then the follow-up question to that was, how about on the horizontal? The horizontal, um, I yeah, uh, I would I would say about the same as the vertical. It it's it's tough to say. I'm, sometimes you have easy to see control targets. Sometimes they aren't as easy to see. But off the bat, a lot of times we see that the horizontal side of things is is actually um, within project spec. Uh, even before registration. Um, so usually it's the vertical that we're trying to chase and and eliminate as much error out of as possible. Um, but yeah, that 500 is typically a, um, a specification that you see across a lot of mobile LiDAR projects. And then Dylan, are there any uh, automated, or, or excuse me, for the automated feature extractions that you demonstrated um, do you need any special modules or is the basic point cloud module and TBC sufficient? Um, you do not need the mobile mapping module. So there's a mobile mapping module that you use to actually perform the registration side of things. Um, but the scanning module is what you would want to have to do a lot of those automated extraction, automated classification and those types of tools. So I would say the answer to that is the scanning module. And the questions are not showing up real well. That's all I see. So I don't know if those guys see any, any others. Yeah, I could pipe in here as far as the accuracy. Um, what we're gonna be doing in the upcoming webinars um, is, as Dylan highlighted, um, we're going to combine all this data. So each one of these is like a quasi deliverable until the end where we combine what Dylan just went through on the um, on the mobile LIDAR side, uh, which we're going to naturally hold for the roadway. Then the uh, aerial LIDAR, which we're going to use for the drainage portion going down that channel that we showed you. And then the um, um, uh, the terrestrial side with uh, 3D lasers that we're going to incorporate going underneath the drainage uh, uh, tunnel. There's a there's a couple of shafts there, and uh, we're going to take a look at that. Um, and then we're also going to be looking at the survey that we uh, conduct 
uh, going through the least square adjustment that we are going to perform and then the hard shots that we're going to take in the field so that we can do a surface to um, to point analysis of that data from physical survey uh, to the um, to the hard surface that we create even off-site so uh, uh, underneath canopy to look for um, uh, lidar uh, echo penetration hitting the tree then top of grass down to ground and see how well that looks uh, so we still have a ways to go on this presentation but the at the end we're going to have a deliverable on a plat uh, just like you would typically see uh, for a drainage study improvement survey showing all the abutting um, um, structures and infrastructure, canopy, trees, poles, and so on. Perfect. Um, yeah, be on the lookout for our upcoming webinars. Uh, we're scheduling, scheduling them just about every month here. Uh, so be on the lookout for uh, for the final date, and that uh, terrestrial scanning one should be coming soon. But with that being said, appreciate your attendance here today, and uh, hope everyone has a good rest of their day.